If you think ColecoVision plays all Atari cartridges... You mean it can't? Here's Pac-Man on ColecoVision. But here's Pac-Man on the Atari 5200 Super System. Now you're talking. And it doesn't work on ColecoVision. Hi everyone, I'm Tyler, and welcome to another episode of Player One Start. Today we're finally going to talk about the Atari versus the ColecoVision. Now if you haven't already, you should probably go back and watch my Atari video and watch my ColecoVision restoration and review, because I'm also going to make some references to that in this video. Atari and Coleco were the top two video game companies of the early 1980s prior to the video game crash. And although they both had great success, they both came from different backgrounds. Atari was built from the industry up, and Coleco was just one of the other companies that decided to jump into the fray. In the early 1960s, a University of Utah engineering student named Nolan Bushnell lost his tuition money in a poker game. He immediately took a job at a pinball arcade near Salt Lake City to make back the money and support himself while he was at school. In school, Bushnell majored in engineering and, like everyone else who had access to the university's supercomputer, was a space war addict. However, his view of the game was different. To his fellow students, space war was just a game. To Bushnell, it seemed like a way to make money. If he can put a game like Space War into a pinball arcade machine, he figured people would line up to play it. After graduating from college in 1968, he moved to California. He wanted to work for Disney, but they turned him down, so he took a day job with an engineering company called Ampex. At night, he worked on building his arcade video game. He converted his daughter's bedroom into a workshop, and scrounged for free parts from Ampex and from other friends at local electronics companies. The monitor for his prototype was a black and white TV he got at Goodwill. An old paint thinner can was the coin box. When he finished building his prototype game, he called it Computer Space, and he looked around for a partner to help him manufacture and sell it. He made a deal with a manufacturer of arcade games called Nutting Associates. Nutting agreed to build and sell the arcade games in exchange for a share of the profits. Bushnell signed on as an engineer for the firm. However, Computer Space was an unbelievable bomb, as people could not really figure out how to play it. Bushnell lamented that most of the people who enjoyed his game had engineering degrees, and that the game was too complicated for the common average person standing at a bar. Most likely as a result of the poor sales of computer space, Bushnell and Nutting Associates went their separate ways. As Nolan Bushnell was convinced that he could do a better job running his own company, he and a friend chipped in $250 apiece to start a company called Syzygy. However, eventually due to legal reasons, they had to change the name to Atari. It was at this time that Bushnell hired an engineer named Al Alcorn to help develop games. Meanwhile, Bushnell installed pinball machines in several local businesses, including a bar called Andy Capp's Tavern. The cash generated by the pinball machines would help fund the company until video games were ready for the market. Alcorn's first assignment was to build a simple ping-pong-style video game. Bushnell had told him that Atari had signed a contract to deliver such a game to General Electric, and it needed to get built right away. However, it was later revealed that Bushnell wasn't telling the truth. He wanted Alcorn to get used to designing games, and wanted him starting out with something simple. Instead of a simple game, Alcorn's ping pong had a touch of realism. When you hit the ball at the center of the paddle, the ball bounced straight ahead. But if you hit the ball with the edge of the paddle, it bounced off at an angle. With Alcorn's enhancements, video ping pong was a lot more fun to play than Bushnell had expected. Once the game was ready, they decided to try it out in one of the local taverns. However, it wasn't too long before they got their first service call that the machine had broken down. Engineer Al Alcorn was relieved to find that the quarter box was overflowing and was just jammed and would not take any more quarters. Through the next few years, Atari would not only produce several different types of Pong consoles, but they would also be battling all of the competitors suddenly bursting into the field. Atari knew that to stay on top of the game, they would need to produce more games, and that meant producing more system boards. In an attempt to save costs, as well as offer more games to home consumers, a new device was planned that would be centered around a CPU, RAM, and graphics chip. However, the ROM chips would be able to be swapped out to allow the system to play different types of games. What eventually would come out of this project would be the Atari Video Computer System, and the birth of the home video game market we know today was born.
Coleco was founded in 1932 by an immigrant Russian shoemaker, Maurice Greenberg. He started out by selling leather supplies to shoemakers. In the 1960s, Greenberg's second son, Arnold, began looking for investments and turned to items such as dolls and tabletop hockey games. After seeing the huge success in 1972 that Nolan Bushnell and Atari had with the game Pong, Coleco decided in 1975 to begin producing their own home Pong console, titled the Telstar, and sold it at a competitively less price than the Atari version. After the success of the first Telstar, Coleco designed and produced nine additional Telstar products for release in December of 1977. But then, something went wrong. Coleco had difficulties with the Telstar due to a conflict with the FCC. Roth Baer informed Coleco that if they would sign a licensing agreement with Magnavox, he and their team would help with the production line difficulties they were experiencing. A shortage of chips from Asia and an East Coast dock strike meant that games didn't make it to retailers. In addition, the market was changing and Coleco hadn't changed with it at all. In 1978, the company lost $22.3 million and ended up scrapping over 1 million Telstar units. The Telstar itself was almost responsible for causing Coleco to go bankrupt in 1980 after interest in Pong-based consoles died out at the end of the 1970s. But once again, Coleco managed to rise from the ashes. In the early 1980s, Coleco began conducting market research to see if it would be possible to create a new game console that could beat Atari and Mattel in the home video game console market. It was also at that time that Coleco started producing a small number of electronic tabletop games. During a fateful trip to Kyoto, Japan, Eric Bromley of Coleco and Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi met to discuss the rights to the mega arcade game hit, Donkey Kong. Bromley called home after the meeting, and Greenberg said, if the game is really that good, then let's go for it. The ColecoVision was packaged with the extremely popular arcade game Donkey Kong when it was released in December of 1982. After four months, Coleco had sold 500,000 units. Later in 1983, sales quickly passed 1 million units, a huge number at that time. Around the time that Coleco was getting ready to enter the video game markets, Atari was also facing stiff competition from the Mattel and Television and other game companies. This caused Atari to revive their plans to make a second video game console as a successor to the Atari 2600. It would feature a different controller and upgraded graphics. Ms. Pac-Man? This Ms. plays only on the Atari 5200 Super System. And now there's an adapter. For 2600 games? Nearly 300 2600 games. Super! System, now with a $30 rebate and Pac-Man from Atari. While Atari keeps trying to sell you new systems like the 5200, with ColecoVision you only need one system. Because ColecoVision expands to give you a Super Action controller set with Super Action Baseball, a driving module with Turbo, an expansion module to play all Atari 2600 games, and only ColecoVision plugs into the Atom module to become the complete Atom computer system. So if you don't want to keep buying new systems, there's only one system to buy, ColecoVision. Sorry, Atari. So let's get started and take a look at both of the consoles. Taking a look at the Atari 5200, you can tell that it has kind of a big size here, and that's mainly to accommodate the two controllers at the top. I gotta tell you, staring at that Atari logo makes me very nostalgic, and I really like the rainbow color scheme below the logo to kind of give it a little bit more of an emphasis. You can see the two controller ports in the front, and some of them came with four. But you move on to the ColecoVision, you can tell there's a huge difference in size. The ColecoVision is almost two-thirds that of the Atari 5200. You can see the chrome plate with also kind of the rainbow color scheme of the early 1980s on there, and that leads down to the expansion module interface. I can say one thing that's unique about the ColecoVision is that it's not symmetrical like the Atari 5200 is. Now I had you guys vote on Twitter based on these images, which one had the better aesthetics, and a lot of you chose the Atari 5200. But will that sway my decision when I'm trying to decide which one of these two actually looks better? Well it was a very tough decision and it came down to just one thing for me. I decided to go ahead and select yes. The ColecoVision. Although I'm not a huge fan of the exposed controllers, I really do like the fact that this console is more compact than the Atari 5200.
Taking a look at the controller design of both the ColecoVision and the Atari 5200, you can tell they both have a similar style. The joystick on the Atari 5200 controller does not self-center and requires you to move it around manually and back to center when you want it to. You can see that there is a start and a brand new pause button, a first on any console, and it has a phone pad below it which can have inserts and overlays on it. You can also see the fire trigger buttons on each side, giving it a lot of buttons total. Moving on to ColecoVision, you can also see the similar foam pad style. It has triggers on both sides, as well as a joystick that you can easily maneuver with your thumb due to its large disc. However, unlike the Intellivision, it does not use the disc to steer directions. Down here you also see something unique to this console, is that you can actually remove the controller and it has a standard controller port interface. This means that you can use another controller with the same port on this console. And I'm going to demonstrate that with the Sega Genesis controller here. This is very useful for me because I'm not accustomed to using a joystick to move characters around on games such as Donkey Kong, Pitfall, and other games. Using a D-pad here actually helps me out a lot. Although some games require you to use the number pad to get the game started, you can easily swap it out once the game starts and continue playing. So this time on my Twitter poll, you guys predicted that the ColecoVision would have the better controllers over the Atari 5200, but which one will I pick? I'm going to say the ColecoVision has better controllers. So I ended up agreeing with the Twitter followers. I'm also going to point out that the Atari 5200 controllers are notorious for breaking very easily, and that just adds to my frustration because when they break, you have to buy a controller that uses the proprietary connection that Atari used for their controllers. Now that we've taken a look at what's different on the outside of these consoles, let's go ahead and take a look at what's under the hood. The amount of RAM in a console determines how many sprites and colors you can have on screen at one time, and the Atari 5200 and the ColecoVision are tied with 16K. Although the ColecoVision keeps all of its RAM on the video chip, and the 5200 shares its RAM with the main processor. Alright, so bear with me as I'm going to get a little bit technical here. I'm not going to attempt to describe how all video game graphics work, but I'm just going to give you a slight overview of how each system is different. First, let's look at the playfield resolution. The playfield is the background. The Atari 2600, not surprisingly, produces the smallest background. However, it's a little bit smaller than you think. Even though it says it uses a 40 pixel wide screen, it actually only uses 20 pixels and it just mirrors that to another side of the screen. The Atari 5200's graphics are a little bit more complicated in the fact that they use tiles or character sets for the background, and that's why there's 14 different modes. When using all 16 colors for the background on a single line, each background line can only be 80 pixels wide. The ColecoVision offers the widest variety for backgrounds, and has the highest resolution for that mode. Sprites, on the other hand, are anything that move on the screen. More likely, it's going to be your player character and enemies. Again, the Atari 2600 is surprisingly limited, only being able to produce three, and I say possibly four sprites on screen at a time. To break this down, there's only going to be one player, two player, and a ball or missile. Sometimes screen flickering is used to produce the illusion of having more than one sprite on screen at a time. A great example is the game Baseball. There are nine characters that take the field, however, each time every character stops moving, it becomes part of the background and is no longer a sprite. If you look carefully, you will never see more than two players moving at a time. And yes, this is the cause of the notorious glitch in Pac-Man where the ghosts just seem to disappear. Here's that same gameplay clip in slow motion. Although this game is very impressively done in terms of a programming standpoint, it really does show off the limitations of the console on how many sprites can be shown up on the screen. By the time Ms. Pac-Man came out, a clever programmer was able to squeeze more detail onto the screen as well as reduce the flickering issue. But you'll see a side effect of these improvements is that the background is not completely drawn as these black lines show up. That's because the processor doesn't have enough time to draw the entire background as well as run the improvements in the code. The Atari 5200 is a bit more advanced, offering 8 on-screen sprites at a time, with 3 colors per sprite. And Pac-Man on the 5200 really shines, especially when compared to the 2600 version. With the increase in the number of sprites, the game does not have to use screen flickering, and thus the game looks a lot better as a result. It also produces screen scrolling. Screen scrolling was a very new concept, and was not widely used until after the Nintendo Entertainment System produced Super Mario Bros. However, a prominent example before that was in the game Pitfall 2. 
As you can see, the screen scrolls vertically up and down very fine as you would in any other screen scroller. Again, the ColecoVision, having a very advanced graphics chip, would be able to produce 32 sprites of one color on screen at once, with a maximum of four per horizontal line. This allowed the ColecoVision to have a lot of action on the screen without having to have any slowdown or sprite flickering as in earlier consoles. Like the 5200, the ColecoVision could also produce screen scrolling. Colors are also difficult to explain because there are a lot of tricks used to produce more on-screen color, but nothing's really changed here with the Atari 2600 being the most primitive. The Atari 5200 really shines when it comes to monochrome graphics. As you would expect, the more color you add to your graphics, the smaller they become. However, the ColecoVision, although it only produces really 16 colors, it uses a variation of different hues and lighting to produce up to 256 colors in its palette. Let's take a look at an example of typical graphics from each system. By taking a look at each port of Donkey Kong for each of these systems, you can get an idea of what each console is capable of. I will point out that the Donkey Kong version shown here is not actually from the Atari 5200, but since the 5200 was largely based on the Atari 8-bit line of computers, I used a screenshot from that because there's no port of Donkey Kong for the Atari 5200. And based on this image, this is how you guys voted on Twitter on which one had the best graphics. Here's another example from each console, Pitfall. Now sound in video games was not as important as in later generations, as many video games did not have a background soundtrack that would play throughout the game. Mainly what these sound chips were designed to do were just to play sound effects that would play throughout the video game. So I'm going to show an example of a game with just sound effects and a game with background music from each console for comparison. Years later, hardcore enthusiasts found ways to squeeze the maximum amount of graphics and sound out of these consoles. Let's go ahead and take a look at a few of these tech demos. Now these tech demos are released years after the console has really lost all of its relevance. Clever programmers have found a way to maximize the amount of sound and graphics that they can get out of these earlier consoles. So although these tech demos are very impressive and really show off what the maximum capability of these consoles were, you will never find graphics or sound like these in regular games. 
All right, and now for the most important contest, let's take a look at the gameplay. First, we'll take a look at a very popular arcade game that was very hard to replicate in the home market because in the arcade it uses vector-based graphics. First, you'll be able to see that both games use a very similar graphical style, although the ColecoVision's colors are a bit brighter. I'm also playing the sound from the Atari 5200 version at this moment, and I'll switch over in a second to the ColecoVision. While both of these games play very similarly, I think it comes down to the controller for me. It's actually easier to control where you shoot on the Atari 5200 because the joystick on the controller does not self-center, so you can actually precisely aim where you want to, and you can just leave the cursor there for a while. On the ColecoVision, you just have to aim just like you would in any other console, so it makes the game a little bit more challenging, but that's not really a deal breaker. Alright, next I'll try out one of my favorite Activision games from this era, Beam Rider. Again, I'll point out that the ColecoVision has a brighter color palette. The gameplay on both of these consoles are identical. However, this time I do not like the Atari joystick because it does not self-center and it will keep moving my character to the left or to the right until I move this joystick back. I actually prefer the ColecoVision on this one because it self-centers the joystick. So before we take a look at this next game, I just gotta tell you, the box art for this game is fantastic. Even scrolling down on the screen, it just looks like a masterpiece. But anyway, let's take a look at Pitfall. Alright, so here we finally have a game that showcases how different the graphics modes are on the Atari versus the ColecoVision. Here you can see that the color palette is much brighter on the Coleco, and actually provides a bit more detail than the Atari 5200. The Atari looks a little less cartoonish, and I actually like the visual style of that just a tad bit better. Again though, I think it comes down to the controller. I think I enjoy the ColecoVision just a tad bit more, because I'm used to playing this game on the Atari 2600, and here having the joystick that doesn't move back to center when you let go of it does not work out very well. With a little bit of irony, we're going to take a look at Sega's ripoff of Donkey Kong, and that is Congo Bongo. First, I should start out by saying that I really don't enjoy this game anyway because of the isometric view. It is very hard to control your character and get them going in the right locations because your D-pad really needs to be put at an angle for you to maneuver your character correctly. I like the look of the Atari graphics better because they look a little less... Again, I keep calling it cartoonish, but it's that bright color palette that I really don't like. It doesn't really look appealing to me on the screen. Again, I will give controls to the ColecoVision because I feel like I have better control over my character than I do on the Atari 5200. Alright, now it's time to compare the defining game for the ColecoVision, and that is Donkey Kong. Unfortunately, there's not a version of Donkey Kong for the Atari 5200, and rather than compare it to the Atari 2600 version, I decided to compare it to one of the Atari 8-bit computer ports. All 
I said this in my original review for the ColecoVision, and I'll reiterate it again. Out of the second generation of home consoles, the ColecoVision does have the best port of Donkey Kong. I mean, just take a look at the original arcade version versus the ColecoVision's home port. I think this was done very well, and I have to give my hats off to Coleco on this one. Next, let's take a look at a game that has a lot of on-screen movement, screen scrolling, and a lot of sprites on screen at one time. And I couldn't think of a better example of this than Defender. Both consoles give a very good representation of this game, and I am very impressed at the amount of movement without any slowdown on both of these consoles. One thing I can say the ColecoVision has in its favor this time is the extra color. The Atari 5200 one looks a little bit more bland and has a lot more black and white than the ColecoVision version does. I also want to point out that while the joystick for the Atari 5200 takes a little bit to get used to, it's actually something that I'm noticing less and less the more I keep playing games on it. And here's another popular arcade game from the 1980s. We'll take a look at Centipede. Again, this is another time where the color palette of the ColecoVision works in its favor, as this actually looks like a centipede on the ColecoVision, as opposed to the gray mess of a caterpillar that appears on the Atari 5200. I found the joystick on the 5200 gives me a bit of an advantage without having to self-centered every time, but this game was also very good on the ColecoVision. I would call this one almost a tie, with me leaning towards the ColecoVision version because of the way it looks. So I wanted to compare Pac-Man on the Atari 5200 versus Pac-Man on the ColecoVision. After all, this was a comparison shown in the advertisements. However, after doing some research, I found out Pac-Man was never released for the ColecoVision. And that's when it dawned on me. In the commercials, Atari was pointing out that the only version of Pac-Man you can play on the ColecoVision is the very crappy one that Atari sold for the 2600. Talk about shooting themselves in the foot with advertising. So even though this is not really a comparison to make, I'm going to compare the Atari 5200 to the Atari 2600 version of Pac-Man. Alright, so obviously the Atari 5200 version was made in an attempt to kind of correct all of the mistakes made with the Atari 2600 version of Pac-Man. And since this is the only version that the ColecoVision can play, at least that's not a homebrew port, I must say that the Atari 5200 wins out in this category. Okay, so before I begin telling you which one I think is better overall in terms of games, graphics, design, controllers, all of that, if you feel like there was a game that better showed the differences between the Atari 5200 and the ColecoVision, you may be right. There may be a different game that I should have tried out here, but I can only try the games that I own. So if I don't own it, I can't try it out. Also, again, I want you to keep in mind that this is my personal opinion. Although I've done a lot of research and I've had you guys answer poll questions online, it ultimately comes down to what I believe and what my personal experience tells me about these consoles. So overall, which console is better? Is it the Atari 5200 or the ColecoVision? I have to say, after putting this video together, I still believe that the ColecoVision is the better console. Now let me explain my reasons why. The main reason why I chose the ColecoVision over the Atari 5200 was mainly due to controller design. And this was also my pet peeve on the Atari versus the Intellivision. I really did find the joystick on the Atari 5200 to be a little bit cumbersome and not as easy to use as the joystick on the ColecoVision. Now granted, I really wish I didn't have to use the entire big phone pad controller at all. And in fact, I don't have to. I can swap it out for a controller that I'm used to. I think that's something that Atari really missed the boat on. I should point out that on the Atari 2600, you can plug in a Sega Genesis controller into it, and it might work. And I understand that Atari had to make a different controller port to support all of the buttons they had on their controllers, but it really should have begged the question, do we need all these buttons? 
I will give credit to the Atari for inventing what seems to be the first pause button I've ever seen on a console, and that is very nice. The next thing I added into perspective are the amount of games for each console. The ColecoVision actually generally has, I think, better quality games, better looking games, than on the Atari 5200. One thing I also fault the Atari 5200 for was not being backwards compatible with the Atari 2600 out of the box. I think that was a real missed opportunity. Now one thing I would like to try but I couldn't do for this video is I would really like to get the attachments for the ColecoVision to turn it into the Atom computer. Currently I'm still missing the items necessary to convert it into the Atom computer and they're not easy to come by and when you do it's not likely to be cheap or they're listed as four parts not working. So for the moment I'm still on the lookout for that and I hope to revisit the ColecoVision when I get these parts in. Alright so that said what do you guys think of my opinion? Do you guys agree with it or not? Let me know in the comments about what you guys think about each of these consoles. Also, I would really like to know those of you that grew up with these consoles, please let me know in the comments what your opinions are. One thing I'd really like to know is do you think that one console aged better than the other? Or if you thought that one was always better and that's the one you've always went with? Alright, so before we wrap things up, I do want to make a couple of points here. First, it took a long time to get this video made. I actually started planning this back when I released my Atari vs. Intellivision video. And the big thing that was keeping me from making this video was the fact that I didn't own a ColecoVision. And finally, after months, I was able to track one down and finish up this video. However, if you guys would like to see projects like this more often, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. If I was able to get support on there, I could get some of this equipment earlier and perhaps get more videos out more often on topics like this. There's also another video I would like to produce, but really I don't have the means to do it yet. One of my long-term goals on this channel is to create a video documentary that would cover the entire second generation Umho video game consoles, from start to finish. If this is something you guys would like to see, please let me know in the comments. I'd really like to see your guys' feedback on it. And I'll let you know as the project progresses what kind of support I'm going to need for it, because I am going to need something. But all of that out of the way, I do want to thank you guys so much for watching. Stay tuned because I have more projects coming. And until my next video, I'll see you next time. All right, well, that's going to wrap it up for this video. Remember, if you like what you see, please hit that like and subscribe button, share with a friend. Please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and stay tuned because I have more content coming. I'll see you guys next time.